illustration, we're going to gather, we're gathering right now um, with our palms and we're going to read the story of Jesus coming in on the donkey. I also want you to know that today our order of worship looks a little different. We're actually going to kind of walk through Palm and Passion Week of Jesus. So some things may be out of order. Um, Howard has our bulletin, so if you want one of those. Um, but I just ask you to kind of put yourself in the story today. We begin with We begin with Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 29. When Jesus had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Let us shout out, shout Hosanna, save, as we sing him 278, Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Palm Sunday is one of my favorite Sundays of this whole year. And I learned to sing Hosanna La Hosanna in this church as a small child. And I never hear it without thinking of the ones who shaped me, molded me, and now wait for me and serve as my cloud of witnesses. So let us join together as we praise this day that gives us the hope as we look forward to Holy Week. I have the pleasure of giving the announcements. First off, Good Friday, we will be joining with Avondale United Methodist Church. That is April 15th, and we will be worshiping at 6 o'clock p.m. in the service that remembers Jesus' trial, conviction, and crucifixion. The address for Avondale is located on the back of your bulletin, but we will be parking in the parking lot there with the entrance that is on Fifth Avenue South. Now, the subject again that has been near and dear to my heart, the Easter egg hunt, I cannot thank you for all that you have done. I texted Emily pictures of my overloaded dining room table as we were sorting out and putting together prize packages for the children who will attend this event. I have sign-up sheets out on the um, bulletin board. If you would like to sign up for something specifically, just kind of let me know because I have a lot of floaters that have said, where you need me, I will go. But if I know that there's something you specifically want to do, um, let me know. Also, a new surprise, we will have pictures available with the Easter Bunny. So if you want your picture made with the Easter Bunny, or you may know of a young person who does, be sure and tell them to come in and see the bunny who will be seated because the bunny can't see out of the eye holes. <laughs> Next Sunday will be our Easter worship. Invite a friend. It is a glorious day and one that we want to share with one another. Also, Next Sunday, if you will, please start bringing stuffed animals for the Amelia Center. It is um, a program for children, parents, families who have lost a loved one. It too is near and dear to my heart. And I would ask that you support their wonderful ministry because I know what a difference it made in my life. Um, they say around 10 inches, so you know, do not bring the life-size <laughs> teddy bear. Please bring something that is manageable. Um, this one really excites me. Marge will be leading a five-week series on the book Speaking Christianity Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m. If you've not heard her, she is one of the most gifted teachers you will ever, ever experience. This will start on April 24th, which is the Sunday after Easter. And in the foyer on the table are free books um, the Speaking Christianity books for this study. Last but not least, um, cover dishes moved from the third Sunday to the fourth Sunday because of Easter and because we are not going to miss an opportunity to eat. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, as we remember how Christ the King entered Jerusalem to the sounds of joyful shouts. Increase our faith and listen to our prayers so that we may praise you every day by always living in him. For Jesus lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
Today I'll begin our gospel reading with Luke chapter 22, 1 through 20. You will stand for the reading of the gospel. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priest and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to them and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper was over, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. <clears throat> May we pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. As we come forward for communion today, I encourage you to sing hymn 2254, the number's up here, and it's in our small hymnal, The Faith We Sing, in remembrance of me. You'll come forward, I'll give you some bread, and then Belinda will have a cup for you. You're invited to come as the ushers share.
We continue in the scriptures. But the hand of him, Jesus said, who is going to betray me, is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Usually, we pray the prayer of confession at the beginning of Holy Communion. We, we pray this confession because we're asking for forgiveness. But now, with this question in the air that the disciples are asking themselves, who might betray Jesus? Let us now confess our sins before God and one another. You'll turn to page 12 in your hymnal. We'll use our prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us to be great. Forgive us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Our next gospel reading is from Luke 22. 39 through 46. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them sleeping, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. Let us pray. Gracious, most powerful, and living God, we give you thanks for all you have given us. Even this very day is a gift. We are sorry for falling asleep, falling asleep in our discipleship and in our care and compassion. It's hard to sit in discomfort and awkwardness. It's hard to sit in the pain. It's hard to walk with you on this week. Holy God, you need us. That's something to be thankful for. You've given us gifts, talents, personalities, even quirks. Again, we are thankful. And we know the world needs us to put these to use, even in discomfort, even in pain. God, use us for healing and reconciliation in the world, or just a, a tiny part of the world. We are thankful to Jesus, and we give you thanks for his life, his death, and for his resurrection. Amen. Our last scripture, last gospel reading today, will be
continue in Luke 22, and I'll ask you to stand as we pick up with verse 77. 47, sorry. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched the ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else, on seeing him, said, You also were one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then, about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? They kept heaping many other insults on him. When the day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, gathered together, and they brought him to their council. They said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. He replied, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them asked, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. May the Spirit of Christ dwell where the word of God is spoken. Indeed. Thanks be to God. May be seated. Something I cherish in life are the stories of my grandparents. And just a few weeks ago, I told you in a sermon a story about my grandmother and her resilience at 100 years old. Eliza and I went to see her a couple of weeks ago, and she told us a story that I don't remember ever hearing before. Our conversation was around dresses, and we were going to buy some dresses for Eliza for her graduation events that she has coming up. Um, my grandmother made most of all of her clothes. She made her children's clothes. She made some of my clothes. But she said for her high school baccalaureate event of assembly, she shopped for a dress at a store. And it was one of the first store-bought dresses she ever had. And the, not, the afternoon of baccalaureate, as she was getting dressed, she became very nervous. And she had this thought come over her that she'd never had it before with her handmade clothes. And it was, what if other girls come in the same dress? <laughs> now, it turned out that no one else had the same dress, but what struck me was how my grandmother felt as a teenager. She felt like teenagers. She felt like I had as a teenager. I used to really struggle with 
my clothes, and I just always felt anxious about them. But I had never considered that my grandmother had those same feelings, because she's always been a confident person in my eyes, except for maybe a razorback name that's a nail biter and she gets a little nervous. But I appreciated that story because it connected me to my grandmother in a new way. Isn't that what stories do? They connect us. And I appreciate and cherish all the stories of my, my grandparents. They help inform me and they tell me of my family and even a little of what's in my own spirit. There's a song that we usually sing on Palm Sunday, but we're not singing it today, but you'll know this first line. Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear. Things that I would ask him if he were here. Scenes by the wayside, tales of the sea, stories of Jesus, tell them to me. Like the stories of my grandparents, we usually more than just love to hear those stories for hearing's sake or for entertainment or enjoyment, but they inform us about who God is and how Jesus lived and taught us about love and forgiveness and oppression and, and about living. Therefore, if we call ourselves disciples of Jesus, then those stories inform us about living in these ways. They connect us through similar emotions or happenings, what a faithful response is, how in different ways we understand the world. These stories of Jesus are part of a living document, our sacred text, which continues to speak to us. The hearing and the reading and, and sometimes the singing of it doesn't stop there. When, when we hold these words in, in such a place that we call them the gospel, the good news, then our witness to these words and stories, that also holds some weight. How is carrying this story of the good news into the world? How are we carrying it into the world? Well, sometimes that's easier to answer in a season like Advent or Christmas or even Easter. Next week, we will read the Easter story, and we will talk about being a witness of the resurrection. But how do we, in a week like this, carry our witness? How do we embody Jesus' passion story? At first, the, the crowds cheered. They were gathered. They saw this parade. They had hope. They, they saw a promised new leader, hope of their salvation, and rebelling against the Roman government also kind of brought them together as they shouted words of protest from the Psalms, the words of protest and praise in protest of the Roman governor who was keeping them oppressed, poor, and in a struggle life, but in praise of, could he be the Messiah? Could he be the king we have waited for? Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us. Now these things are good. This gathering, how they spread their, their palms and their clothes down to welcome Jesus as a new king. These are good. But how does their witness change as the stakes begin to be raised in later days? Judas is offered money to betray Jesus. His witness to the story 
is sold for gold. Can our witness be bought? Do monetary or material desires distract us from our witness? From doing hard work and standing up or, or being there for those who are oppressed? Not staying quiet in the face of injustice? whether that's for ourselves or our neighbors. The disciples, they fall asleep when it's time to pray. And then one turns to violence when the guards come to arrest Jesus. And neither one of these responses or witnesses are what Jesus wants. Peter, Peter is the one who knew him so well, he'd heard the truth. He knew the threat of danger and violence up ahead. He says at the table, his witness will stand. He will walk with Jesus throughout what is to come. I'll go with you, Jesus, to prison, to death. But Peter falls away. He says, I do not know the man. Is that for self-preservation? Is it, in a way, preserving his witness for the rest of the story? Is it just fear overcoming him like it would many of us? Now, the religious leaders want to stop the story. They were the ones who felt they were doing the work of God in the way they practiced their religion. And they want to stop Jesus, so they turn him over to Pilate to rule his faith, which when we read in the next chapter, chapter 23, we'll see that Pilate was hesitant to do so. So he passes him to Herod. Herod passes him back to Pilate. All these leaders just mostly want to keep the peace, make people happy so they won't riot. The crowds are then stirred to ask for Jesus' death. And the women cry as he walks to Golgotha. And the men crucified on either side of him ask to be saved. What is it? How is it that we who are not in person, who are not in person witnesses to Jesus' passion, but we claim the story of his passion as one of the most significant parts of our faith. How is that our witness? How does that story live in and live out of you? Does worshiping a crucified God make a difference? Does it bring a connection to the suffering in your own life? Throughout this story, Jesus wants to be with his disciples and followers. He says, I have desired to eat the Passover with you. And then on the Mount of Olives, he says, stay and pray with me. But staying with is hard. How, how do we sit with or stand with those who are suffering today? Those who are God's children? What is our witness of Jesus' story to those who are fighting for their lives and their freedom? What is our witness for the powerless and to the powerful. So at the table, Jesus asked his disciples to remember him. Do this in remembrance of me. But not as a sentimental act. A sentimental act is me looking at a picture of my grandmother in the, her store-bought dress with a nervous smile on her face. But we do so remembering Jesus in a different way. 
It's like when we say the liturgy, the communion liturgy, and liturgy means the work of the people. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice. How do you do that? That's something only you can decide. The question is, how will we witness to the passion of Jesus? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. Join for our offertory prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless these gifts that we give to you from the abundance that you have first given us. Help them be magnified and glorified to your kingdom and your work here on this earth. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
that you will join us at Avondale Methodist on Friday for our Good Friday service. We will be telling the whole passion story that evening. We will sing. We will worship together in that solemn space and time. But now, as you go forward from this place on this day, go forward with shouts of Hosanna, with thinking about your question, how am I a witness to Jesus? As we go, let us know that God, who is our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, walks with us. Amen. 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 Amen.